Thank you very much indeed to Paul for, I think, an inspirational opening That's and right. to Ivan for setting a context for this particular discussion uh, where we're looking at supporting the community and voluntary sector uh, to maximize its contribution. And the way we're going to run this is I'm going to ask each of the panelists to speak for up to five minutes, and I mean that. Um, uh, and so I will give them um, just a small signal at four minutes to say you have a minute left, and then we'll come and have a, um, a less structured discussion with you afterwards. That's been agreed with everybody. Uh, so once the important thing of Sorry. hydration is sorted out, which is important, um, we'll, we'll get going. And Kevin, uh, I might ask you to start. You have slides, I think, so we'll, you're going to need the clicker. No, I don't. Oh, you don't? All right, no. okay. okay. So thank, thank you very much. Ivan started off by giving some indication of what you're doing. If you would just be able to maybe talk us through what, what, what you'd like to say at this stage. Yeah, and first, just to say thanks very much for the, for the opportunity to be here, number one, and to, to share our perspectives on this, because we are a relatively new department, um, established in July 2017, so coming up to our second anniversary now. Um, and there's a real benefit for us in being able to engage directly with people here, the various practitioners right, from right across the, right across the system. Um, first of all, to, I suppose, share an awareness of what we are trying to achieve as a department, um, but secondly, to hear from you in, in terms of your perspective on that. Um, so just to say a little bit, Ivan has already given a reasonably good overview of some of the key policy initiatives that we're engaged in at the moment. Um, and obviously, I suppose, the starting point for me is the department's own mission and, and the basis and the rationale behind the establishment of the department, which was to promote rural and community development and to support vibrant and sustainable communities throughout Ireland. So obviously the community and voluntary sectors are absolutely critical to that mission. Um, I mean, the state generally cannot deliver on what the state needs to deliver without the community and voluntary sector and the, the involvement, the enthusiasm, the innovation, the creativity, um, the, the, I suppose the agenda leading uh, behavior that we, that, that, that we have grown um, to rely on in this country, and we have a very deep culture, obviously, of that. Um, it's one of the great, I suppose, one, I think it's one of the great stories of Irish enterprise, indeed, the sort of the story of social enterprise, social activism, community activism, the involvement of people in their own communities and identifying their needs in producing solutions, in delivering on solutions, in generating support, in generating funding, in making, making things happen. Um, so our role as a department is to try to lead on behalf of government in managing that relationship to, as I say, create sustainable, vibrant, inclusive communities. I'd, I'd see three main dimensions to our role. One is to work with colleagues across government in trying to bring some of the coherence that people want from government um, in respect of creating those supportive conditions for, for communities, um, for communities to, to, to thrive, to identify their own needs and to, make, uh, and, 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 and to make those happen. Secondly, we have direct responsibility for a number of government strategic policy initiatives and Ivan has has name-checked some of the main ones there. I'll say a little bit more about those and maybe about some of the others. And thirdly, then, we have funding responsibility for a number of programs um, that impact directly on the quality of community life. So just, just to say a little bit about, about that policy framework first, and Ivan has talked about the 2015 framework document, which is really, a, I suppose, a, sen a seminal um, document from government's point of view in setting out a vision for local and community development in Ireland. Um, now, it talks, when you, when you go back to that document of vibrant, sustainable, self-determining communities, so the very stuff that's at the core of our mission. But it talks also about participative and local democracy, providing community members with the opportunity, the means, the confidence, the skills to influence, to participate, to shape. Um, and there's a lot of layers to that vision when you begin to unpack it. And I think the work that we're involved in at the moment in developing the action plan or the 10-year strategy that I even referred to is about unpacking that and trying to translate it into a series of actions that we can agree on and that we can deliver on um, over the coming years. For me, I suppose a, a, a big piece of it 
has been the process in developing that implementation plan. It has been very much a co-production approach um, with you know, government departments, local government, the community and voluntary sector heavily involved in identifying what those actions are and what they need to be. And that, that has been very positive. It's been very effective. It's been a real collaboration. And hopefully we can, we can take that forward into the implementation phase because that's always where the big challenge lies. Um, Hopefully it will be an ambitious strategy, um, and hopefully it can make a difference. Um, I believe it can. Uh, what has fed into that, does, does a couple of things have fed into it that I'll just mention. One is a review of the LCDCs, which has been an important piece of work. And another is the public participation networks um, and their future as part of the overall architecture. That's been a real innovation in the Irish system, um, a really important innovation. Um, They've, there's been significant progress in the growth of the, of the PPNs. We now have over 15,000 members registered at the end of last year. Uh, there are opportunities to strengthen that as, as a, as a decision-making process at local level, um, and there will be some good direction, I think, to that. We've seen, I suppose, we've seen some really good practice, um, but it's not, it's not consistent, and we need to identify how we, how we ensure that the best becomes, I suppose, the, the, the universal experience there. One but, minute, Kevin. One OK. Minute. I'll, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll go an awful lot quicker. Ivan has talked about the volunteering strategy and social enterprise development strategy. So they're, they're obviously key parts of that overall suite of um, policy initiatives that we're, that, that, that we're seeking to deliver on. Um, but I, I want to also mention the Action Plan for Rural Development because we, we, like a lot of a lot of our mission, and we'll talk a lot about the community development mission. But you know, for rural Ireland, there are communities there where there are real development needs, um, and we're we're out at the moment actually consulting on the next phase of rural development um, and uh, the, the 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 needs in terms of the landscape there. And it's a very changing landscape in terms of the climate action agenda, um, in terms of the opportunities now of a new digital age, um, you know, the national broadband plan rollout is going to be very significant for rural Ireland and our, our job is to ensure that communities can, can, I suppose, yield the potential of that now in terms of connectivity, but the impact that that can have on their lives in economic terms and in social terms, in terms of social inclusion and so on. Um, the volunteering strategy, we'll get a chance to talk a little bit more about that, but I mean, it's enormous for us in terms of the scale of voluntary activity and I'd being able to identify how we can support that, how we can make that better, how we can make it easier for people to volunteer, how we can encourage volu volunteerism, because it's such an enormous part of, um, of, of our cultural landscape. Um, but just to mention as well, we do have responsibility for funding a number of programs that Im impact directly on community life. So things like SICAP, the Community Services Program, a whole range of social inclusion measures, whether it's under the Dormant Accounts Fund, um, whether it's the Community Enhancement Program, the Dublin North East Inner City Project, uh, where there's really potentially brilliant learning, I think, for us in terms of how you impact on the quality of life in a community and how you can, how you can, can, uh, can replicate that more widely. Um, and, and also, and there's uh, a, finally, I'll, I'll just say very, very quickly, a lot of the investments that we make on the rural side, like leader, town and villages, claw, etc., etc., what's underappreciated about all of those is this is government investing in communities, identifying their own ideas, generating their own ideas, and making it happen. And there's a massive community empowerment dimension to all of that. And I'm really struck, we, we, we've been out on a roadshow recently, uh, the Rural Opportunities Roadshow, and it's really striking to see the stories that people are telling around how access to funding, generated a community engagement and involvement that led to brilliant new things happening. And there's a big challenge for us in showcasing that, in learning from that, in ensuring that others can take that forward in their own communities. That's, that's, that's I think, a big challenge for us. So I've overrun my time, so I won't attempt to say <laughs> any more, but hopefully we'll get back no, to that. No, that's great. Uh, hopefully we will. We'll unpack things maybe a little bit more. But just to 
give that broad overview first for all of you. And I think I failed at the start to say even who you were, but it became clear. Okay. Uh, Kevin McCarthy <laughs> is the Secretary General of the Department of uh, Rural and Community Development. Um, and so I'm going to move on now, Jane, on to you, I think. And J Jane Gibson, amongst many other things, is the co-author of the report of the Independent Review Group, which was examining the role of voluntary organisations in health and personal social services. All of them have much longer, very impressive biographies, makes you jealous. Um, they're all in the, um, in the program, but I, I don't want to waste our time here by putting all of that up front. And I have okayed that with all of them. They're not precious about them. <laughs> Thanks very much. Jane, can uh, you just maybe give us a little bit of an overview? Thank you. Yep. Th thank you very much for inviting me uh, to come here. Um, I think uh, when we started our work, um, it was very clear to us from the outset that the, the voluntary sector felt under siege, under threat. Uh, but of course, the other side of the story is the HSE, which was largely the largest funder of, uh, of the sector that we were looking at, was equally under threat and being pilloried in the, in the press for having budgetary overruns and everything. So it was not a very uh, happy situation. Um, Rather than go through the 24 recommendations, I thought it might be more useful to talk about um, how we went about our work and, and what the findings were which led us to make the recommendations, which we tried to make sure were, were evidence-based. So we met with uh, over 40 um, uh, stakeholders, primarily from the voluntary sector, and I would have met many of you or, or representatives from your organisations. And uh, it, it was, we, we very much appreciated the, uh, the honesty and the, um, the candor uh, of those discussions. And we also recognize very much that uh, you appreciate that as, uh, given that you receive the bulk of your funds from the state, comes accountability, the need for accountability and openness and transparency. So you weren't trying to get anything for, for, for nothing. And I think sometimes you had a feeling that the HSE thought uh, that was your, your attitude. And it was very clear that that wasn't the case. So we met with many of you. We had a public consultation. We didn't get a huge response to that. But it was interesting, and, we, and also a number of uh, organisations and groups of organisations took the opportunity to make written submissions, which, uh, and some of them put in an enormous amount of work into those, and they were really useful to us. Uh, we tried to use all the plethora of previous reports and not repeat what others have done. Um, and very importantly, we looked at other countries and not the usual suspects. When it comes to health and social care, we tend always to look to the UK or possibly Australia or New Zealand, English-speaking countries. And I think the fact that our group was chaired by Catherine Day, the former Secretary General of the European Commission, she brought a Europe, strong European dimension. And if you think about the history of our voluntary sector here, it's largely based in, in the church before the, the state provided these services. Uh, and and uh, particularly the, the, the Catholic Church. So looking at Catholic countries, and interestingly, countries like France, which has a very clear separation between church and state, and yet it has a very large voluntary sector that still is, uh, has its origins in, in the church, and it seems to manage to uh, have the whole system work together with, with public uh, hospitals, for example, uh, voluntary hospitals, and private hospitals, and they all collaborate together in a, in a well-governed and uh, uh, smooth-running system. So we learnt a lot from looking at other European countries, which was very useful. So what were our main findings? Well, the kind of obvious one of the mutual independence, interdependence between the voluntary sector and the state. So uh, something like almost 30% of hospital beds are in the voluntary sector. Two-thirds of disability services are provided by the voluntary sector. And the um, voluntary sector accounts for about a quarter of the HSE budget. So it's a huge um, sector. Uh, it was very clear to us from the outset the positive value that the voluntary sector brings in terms of in innovation and um, advocacy and flexibility. And very importantly, being rooted in the local, local communities. Um, and, and, and therefore making decisions very close to the, to the service users and the community. Weaknesses that, that were identified, sometimes weak governance. We were asked to look at, at governance. Some of the organizations have very, very large boards and they're not necessarily made of the, the right mix of, of, of expertise. Uh, financial management, not always as good as it should be. Um, not always a, a strategic approach, very focused on, on delivering the services and not sort of thinking in the broader context of the health and social care system. Uh, a degree of duplication, um, 
Now, duplication is not necessarily a, a, a bad thing, but uh, dupl duplication uh, can uh, are, give rise to additional costs. Uh, and issues around succession planning, you know, you get, especially with the smaller organizations, you get very enthusiastic people that set them up at the beginning, and how is this going to be sustained into the future needs to be considered. So there are concerns over service continuity. Uh, and then, of course, concerns over uh, liquidity and responsibility. A, a, a number of you expressed concern that uh, they, they potentially could be accused of reckless trading. So this was uh, a very serious issue that we, uh, we took on board. One, um, min one so minute, Jane. One minute, okay. So what was the, what was the uh, conclusion from all this? Well, absolutely, to reset the relationship between the two between the voluntary sector and the state. And there has to be uh, a recognition of this mutual, uh, inter mutual inter interdependence and mutual trust. One needs the other. And the voluntary sector needs to be recognized, as it is in France, as an integral part of the health and social care delivery system, not a kind of sort of add-on that sits out there on the outside. It needs to be part, an integral part of the way in which we, we deliver services, which was why one of our recommendations was around essential services. Make a list of essential services, and then the voluntary sector and, and indeed the private sector can bid to provide those services, but it's on a full cost basis. Uh, and equally, things like multi-annual funding are very, very important to enable uh, vol the voluntary sector to plan. This, this sort of hand-to-mouth existence on an annual basis is, is, is hopeless when it comes to trying to, to, uh, to plan. And of course, the voluntary sector, as you well know, you have to play your part in all of this. Uh, those who haven't modernized their governance need to do that. Um, you do need to look at, at issues around uh, duplication. It doesn't necessarily mean mergers of smaller organizations. It just need, it means looking at um, where, where there could perhaps be a bit of streamlining. Uh, we very much uh, welcomed the, the Charities Regulator Initiative in relation to the Charities Passport. We had looked at how it was working in Australia, and I think it was a very interesting model, and because the, the level of duplication of requests for inf information was frightening, and coming from very often from different parts of the HSC to the same organization looking for the same or very similar information. This is a complete waste of resources. It's waste of time and effort for you, but it's also a waste of time and effort and cost for the state because they have to request the money, the, the, the information, they have to manage it. Uh, uh, so it, it makes sense to try and, uh, and streamline and to be clear as to why you're, they, they want these particular pieces of information. That wasn't always uh, clear to us why they were requesting particular pieces of information. So. In I, conclusion. I, I'm finishing uh, to thank you, thank you very much for your engagement in, in, in the process. It was, it was hugely interesting, and we came away with uh, a very clear understanding of the vital role that the sector plays in the delivery of our health and social care services. Thank you. Thanks a million. Thanks. So that's, that's two, two contributors already who've packed an awful lot into what they said. But I mean, it's relevant for this. It's also relevant for the parallel sessions that will be coming up at a later stage where things can be, uh, can be unraveled a bit more. We're, uh, Helen, I'm, uh, you got an honourable mention right at the end of Jane's uh, talk yes. there. Um, <laughs> as interim CEO of the Charities Regulator, I might ask you to go next, if that's OK. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just had a couple of slides here. There they are. Um, Ivan had touched on earlier in terms of the Charities Governance Code and its genesis. So we had a significant period of consultation. And what we got back very strongly in terms of the consultative panel um, and also in terms of my own um, attendance at those consultation meetings um, that, that we had, for example, was that there was a real desire on the part of charities themselves for the charities regulator to have a code of governance for charities. Not uh, in other countries you would have it that the, the sector itself owns the governance code, but certainly, as I said, what came back to me was that they want the charities regulator to have this code of governance so that um, I think it was to, to give it a legitimacy so that they could say to their volunteers, to their fellow board members, this is a, a requirement. Um, the charities regulator is looking at this and to give uh, charities that extra push to put in place the, the key foundation that they need in order to carry out their activities and achieve their charitable purpose. And that is actually backed up as well by our own experience in the Charities Regulator of the types of concerns that we receive from the public. 
Now, concerns might come from um, people who are working in charities themselves, members of the public who've had some dealing with the charity. And what came back, or what, when we looked at the analysis and we would have published our figures um, for, for 2017, was that over 50% of the concerns related to issues around um, internal financial controls, uh, transparency, and other governance issues. So the Charities Governance Code, from the Charities Regulator's perspective, is very much intended to be a tool, you know, a tool for charities to ensure that they know what to do. We had a lot of people saying to us at the beginning, oh look, you know, why do we have to you know, keep these particular uh, records? And we'd say, well actually under the Charities Act you're required to keep proper books of account. You know, if, if anybody arrives out, including ourselves, you need to be able to show us on a given day that you can account for the money's coming in, what's been spent. Um, and you know, you're trying to explain this to people and saying, well, and the minute you, you mention legislation, people are kind of go, oh, you know, this is, you know, what, there's no point quoting legislation to me, I just want to know what I have to do. And that is why we spent a, a huge amount of time and effort um, assisted by the, the stakeholders of the charity sector itself um, and from the public and from other experts in this area to make sure that we ended up with uh, a governance code that was practical, that was easy to understand. So what we have is a code now that I think is, is easy to understand. I think it's written very well. We put a lot of work into that um, in order to ensure that it was, it was a NALA uh, approved document. And so what we have now are six principles, 32 uh, core standards, and then 17 additional standards. I'm not gonna go into, into all of those now, except I suppose to say that the six principles um, that you can see there up on the slides, they were very much intended to categorize the legal duties and obligations that charities uh, have and to, to show, I suppose, charity trustees where these things different sit in terms of the duties that they have and, and why. So um, looking, we'll say, at um, exercising control, I'm just going to use this as an example. I, th I think this is a good example. So if you look at the core standard 4.4, it says make sure you've appropriate financial controls in place to manage and account for your charity's money and other assets. And we had an internal, uh, or sorry, an internal financial controls guidance document issued back in 2017. If you haven't read that, I, I, I would hope most people have read it because it is an incredibly practical and useful document. Mm. And certainly time, every time I even read it myself, I spot something else that I think, God, I must mention that when, when people ask me about that, that type of query. Mm. Um, it's excellent because it has checklists. So as a group of charity trustees, if you want to make sure you're meeting this core standard, there's a piece of guidance there for you where you can sit around as charity trustees and go through the checklist to make sure that, for example, if you have um, charity visa cards, if you've got bank accounts, how you're managing those and what kind of controls you should have in place. And it, it gives you a, a roadmap. What, what are the kind of things we need to have in place to ensure that we're meeting this core standard? People have said to me, is the court, okay? People have said to me, um, you know, is the court, uh, the, the code a legal document? Um, and I was talking to someone earlier about this. It's not in itself a, a legal document, but it is based on your legal obligations. So what I was just talking about there in terms of uh, being able to ensure that you, you have a prop, uh, appropriate financial controls in place, you can account for your money. That is really deriving from section 47 of our act, which talks about the duty to keep proper books of accounts. And I know that some, some charities, um, they're very conscious of this, and I've certainly seen annual reports from, from very small charities, and they can tell you to the penny what they spent the money on and everything that they did. And you can actually see the impact, funnily enough, from that, because they go into so much detail, because they give you why they weren't, wanted to do it, and then what they spent it on and what they did. So it should be possible for everybody, in my view, regardless of size, to be able to see what money's coming in, what did you collect it for? Um, are you using it for what you collected it for? Um, and are you accounting for it properly and keeping proper books of account? Mm -hmm. And if you, if you can do that, and if you have these financial controls um, in place, which can be relatively straightforward, then this, this is a core standard that you're probably already meeting. And I would think that most charities that are well run um, are already meeting a lot of these of these core standards. So just moving on then to the, the key dates, we're, we're very much looking at this as a 2019, as a learning year. So we're saying to charities, look at the code, um, get involved, there's guidance materials out there. We're hoping to roll out training. We were hoping to do it earlier in the year, but unfortunately resources didn't permit it, but it, it is on the way and it's something that we are committed to doing. This is training around the country, so it wouldn't just be a Dublin centric. I know that can be a concern sometimes. We're very conscious of that. 
and we're very conscious that we want to get in touch with the very small charities who, um, in particular, who form a large cohort of our register, um, but who maybe aren't represented by bod bodies such as, as The Wheel, you know, and, and other similar representative bodies. Um, next year would really be about implementing the code. Just as a charity, you, you have your record forms. That's supposed to be a tool for you, you know, that you can check yourselves that you're in compliance as charity trustees and that when it comes the following year to saying to the charities regulator, the public, volunteers, prospective charity trustees that you're in compliance with the code, that you have assurance as charity trustees, as the people responsible for the charity, that you have everything in place. And we would very much like people to view it in that way. It's not some form of enforcement tool that we've suddenly introduced that we want it to be, you know, a massive compliance burden on people. It is very much there to assist you. And that's the way that we're approaching it. So we, we've launched our toolkit and the first tranche of guidance under that. We'll have further materials in that. They're very basic things like minutes, how to do minutes and, and things like that. And okay. we're hoping that that's going to be useful. Okay, so thank, thank you very, very much time. indeed for that. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll pass it over to Jane Ann there. So uh, next I'm going to call on Jane Ann O'Connell, who's working in the Slauncher Care Program Implementation Office to give an overview from your perspective as an emerging implementation program. Thanks, Jane Ann. Sure, thank you, Noli. Um, and thank you for inviting us here today as well. I suppose I'll begin by saying that when Slauncher Care was initially launched, we were going to be the Slauncher Care Program Office, uh, but we did insert the word implementation because implementation is really key for what we're hoping to do. Um, just to reflect on what Ivan was saying in the opening. So, really the backdrop to what Slaunch Care is, uh, what we're looking at over the uh, coming years is a huge change in our population. So there is going to be a huge increase in the number of people aged over 65, uh, with the most steepest rises will actually be in those over the age 85. Um, and this is really going to lead to increased demands on our health service, which we all know already there's enormous demands on them. Um, so, it is largely because of a good news story. People are living longer because of improvements that have been made across the system. Mm. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of people are living longer with chronic disease, uh, more than one disease, and that is really what we're trying to address. Uh, so, the objectives of Slaunch Care, so these really originate in the Eruptus report. Um, that was a joint um, all-party committee reached on consensus, and it's come through all the way through to our action plan for this year. Um, so we're looking to promote the health of the population in the first place. So to try to really prevent illness. Um, as I was saying, uh, many people are living longer, but with chronic disease. But some people aren't developing that. So this is really to try to promote people to have a healthier form of ageing. Uh, we're also aiming to bring the majority of care actually into the community setting. So out of the acute sector. Um, and that's something that's really key to everyone, well, not everyone here today, but the community sector is huge, particularly when it comes to social care, disability, residential services. Uh, we're heavily reliant on the voluntary sector. Um, create an integrated system of care. So that would be different healthcare professionals working closely together. Uh, what we have seen until now is a somewhat fragmented system, uh, largely due to do with the historical context of how services have emerged. But we really do need to be moving forward so that it's a much more wraparound integrated system. Um, care should be provided on the basis of need not ability to pay, and in particular, the Oroctus report said that it should be at a low cost or no cost basis. So this is where we're trying to move towards, um, and to move our system from long waiting times to a timely service. And these are really some of the priorities at the moment for 2019. Uh, drive accountability and performance in the health service. Um, in the statutory sector as well as the community and the voluntary, and also to deliver a health service that has the capacity and the ability to plan for and manage changing needs, so to try to be a bit more adaptable. Um, so essentially, this all boils down to providing the right care in the right place by, at the right time and by the right team. I mean, quite often we talk about beds within the system, and these beds are quite often within hospitals. They're in an acute setting. Um, but I once heard Laura McGahey, our executive director, mention that she sees when we're looking at beds, like all beds should be counted, including your own bed. So in some other countries, some services are delivered within the home. Um, in Ireland, we haven't gone as far as, as um, others have been able to, but when appropriate, it really should be at the lowest level of complexity. 
And how are we going to do this? Well, by working together. I mean, we're, we're a small team. Um, we're certainly not able to do it alone, so we are looking to do this in partnership uh, with citizens, uh, with staff and delivery partners. Um, that would be within the statutory and also the community and voluntary sector. Um, elected representatives, so uh, the, that committee that first produced the consensus-based report, um, the Oireachtas Committee on Health and so forth, and then also wider determinant stakeholders. Um, because it really is, I mean, there's an enormous number of factors that contribute to people's health. Already the LCDCs have been mentioned, Healthy Ireland ties in with them, the environment, so many factors really do um, have an impact on people's health and well-being and how they age. And you have a minute. I have a minute, okay, right. Well, the Programme Implementation Office is not going to duplicate effort. Uh, so really what we're trying to do is really drive the reform. An awful lot of this stuff is happening anyway, um, and it's really to make sure that everyone is working on the same plan, working together. Um, so we're trying to ensure that all parts of the system are following the strategy. We're trying to push things where they need to be pushed, work collaboratively where it's needed, and to support the reform efforts um, across the whole system. Um, so this is the whole system framework. It's published within the action plan, so please, um, I'd invite you all to take some time yourselves to read it. Um, but this is, it's not necessarily sequential, but there's a number of elements that we'll be looking at, no matter what aspects of the health system um, we're examining. So whether that's the acute sector, primary care, social care, um, certain things are important. Population-based planning, um, e-health technology, um, accountability, and so forth. And so, all these recommendations have basically been broken down into four different work streams. Each of those work streams have five different programs underneath them, um, and all of those programs have a number of projects as well. Uh, so it's a very complex, um, a very, very complex task um, with enormous amount of actors uh, right across the system, um, and this is how it's actually been broken down. So the first work stream is on service redesign, support and infrastructure. The second one is going to be on safe care, value for money, coordinated governance, teams of the future, and then also sharing progress, so to make sure that everybody knows um, how everything is developing. And really, though, implementation isn't easy. So I would just really like to sort of flag people think it's a straight line and, you know, it's all easy to go, but quite often it is a very squiggly path. And already there have been a number of um, activities that, that we've uh, completed. We've published our quarter one progress report when all the actions have been delivered. Um, but it isn't easy. But we are certainly doing our best. So thank, thank you for your attention. Thanks very much, Jane-Anne. And can we all borrow the squiggly success map as well <laughs> if we need it from time to time? Um, moving over, Una, I haven't forgotten, even though you're at the far end of this rather gorgeous stage. Uh, so Una Buckley is the Deputy Secretary General in the Department of Justice. And I invite you to give a short uh, input at this stage. Thanks, Una. Um, thanks very much, uh, Nolene, and I'm delighted to be here. Thanks, Deirdre and, and the team in the wheel for, for inviting me on such an important day. Um, I will be well capable of staying within my five minutes, I hope. We'll um, see. <laughs> <laughs> um, so a couple of things I want to say. Probably in comparison to the Department of Health and the HSE, we, we have a relatively small funding program. We, we channeled uh, just over 40 million in funds into the NGO sector last year from the Department of Justice to some hundreds of different NGOs, and the amounts were small in the main, less than six, six figure sums in most cases. In general, the type of work that we ask our NGOs to perform for us is to target vulnerable people, whether that's vulnerable people because they are about to be released from prison or have been just been released from prison, whether they're vulnerable because they have arrived in the country, don't speak the language, don't know what Ireland's like and what they need to do here. Um, and we generally target things like education uh, and employment, and so that's the key aspects of, of what we're looking at, as well as supporting our broader strategies around equality, of course. Um, why do we use the NGO sector? We use them because you can find the people that we can't find, the people who are in need, whose needs are extremely complex, who might be, have multi-needs, um, and whose experience of the state is, would tend to suggest that they wouldn't approach the state for help. So either that's because they have had experience, say, of criminal justice in the state, and that's their experience of the state, 
uh, or they have complex needs as, as they grow up as children, or indeed they've come from other countries where approaching the state is not a healthy thing to do. So um, that's why we need you to do this work for us, to find those people and deliver the sorts of uh, uh, policy work that we want to encourage into that space. Where do we find that that sometimes can be a problem is that um, there can be a mismatch between what we want you to do and what you are willing to offer us. So commonly the problem there would be maybe gaps in your knowledge of our policy priorities and what it is that, that we, we are targeting and, or where we want our funding to go. Um, and, and the sorts of projects that we, can, uh, that we get offered tend not to fit within our policy priority space. So a, a key takeaway perhaps from this morning is uh, try and gain more familiarity with the policy priorities of the government departments that you want to seek funding from. Um, the other aspect that we're finding, and we, we issued a review recently on our social enterprise work uh, out of the probation service, which I think is a, a useful document, and obviously that has come away with some learnings for us. So learnings that, for example, are the way in which we procure uh, services doesn't particularly work in very small social enterprises because they're kind of shut out of our procurement supply chains. So that's work that we have to do um, to try and, and, and work that systems back up into, 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 um, into what we do. The other thing I should say, and I, I can tell you, you are um, the first outside audience to get a, a, a sneak peek at this work of transforming the Department of Justice and Equality. Uh, the department has had some recent troubles, <laughs> and as a consequence of that, um, uh, a report was drawn up at the behest of government and adopted by government by a group called the ERG, not the same group in the Conservative Party, a different group, um, who have recommended a very radical reconstruction and reformulation of the department that will have implications for our stakeholders, including the NGO network. Um, so just to briefly go through that, um, this is our starting point. This is where we are at the moment, and this would be the organogram of a classic government department where, for example, just to take uh, one of the areas working for me, uh, you've got asylum services, integration and equality, where people within that, that group set the policy, interface with the stakeholders, answer all the parliamentary questions, decide on the funding needs, distribute the funding, and so on and so forth. This all comes from the same small group of people. Um, that's a not a resilient model for a government department, and it does mean that while it's possible for, say, an individual NGO to build up a good relationship in terms of, say, lobbying on the one hand and seeking funding on the other hand, you are all driving it through the same small group of individuals. Uh, on foot of the reform program, we have already restructured the department um, radically by the standards of the Department of Justice and Equality, which is an old department. It's an old and really important department of state. So uh, with my appointment, um, we restructured the department into two equal areas. One uh, headed up by my colleague, also ironically, Una. Um, so we've created a grade for the Unas. Um, <laughs> Uh, who's heading up our criminal justice area, and then myself incorporating, for the first time actually, aligning asylum services, integration equality, civil law reform and courts, and importantly, our immigration services. So um, that, has, that development has been uh, already a very major change in the way in which we do our business. And we're still working through the consequences of that in terms of how we're managing the, the work of the department, managing business planning and risk, and so on and so forth. And you've a minute. But, thank you. Dying but this is stage. only the uh, first uh, of what is about to become a much more radical transformation, and this is the one that has implications for yourselves. Um, by the reopening of Parliament, in September. We would intend to have restructured our entire uh, workforce into completely new areas of work delivery. And those are policy, legislation, governance, operations, and service delivery, um, and transparency. As you will see, we have been working through the model. This, was, this functional model was proposed by the ERG, and we've been working through how it will work in the Department of Justice and Equality system. Um, 
Transparency will be our voice to the world. Policy will be how we decide what we want to do. Legislation, a key output of the Department of Justice always, will be how we, we write that into law. Governance will be how we manage our agencies, uh, their budgets, and their, our interactions with them, our setting of KPIs. Operations will be how we perform our business, so very much in the PMO space, a bit like um, Hitan was talking about, but also we'll deal with um, issues around funding of third-party stakeholders such as yourselves. And then, obviously, the Department of Justice, a bit unexpectedly, has a very large public-facing arrangement in terms of doing things as varied as um, border management at Dublin Airport, all the way to administering direct provision, which I know isn't the most popular thing in the world. So, but we have a very big public-facing arrangement, and we have to incorporate that as well. That's what each of those functions is intended to do in broad terms. We have done the high-level design, which is this. We are now at the detailed design and the design of role profiles for our staff. And in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have to start assigning names into each of those jobs. So the bloodbath will begin. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there are big, the, the one thing I just want to flag for you is that this will mean that you will have to change the way in which you interact with our department. So in other words, instead of just looking at Nolene, instead of having a COSC, mm. COSC will be gone that identity will, ha will have been removed yeah. and there, there will have to be interactions with a number of different individuals. So we'll say lobbying in the policy space or the legislative space, but seeking funding from the operations side. So it's a, it's a different relationship will be created. And I should also say, and I know Kevin is looking uncomfortable, that it is expected that when we make this model work very successfully in the <laughs> Department of Justice, that this model will roll out across the rest of the civil service. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much, Una. Um, I, 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 would have been, I would have been absolutely murdered if I'd stopped you when all that really important information was coming out. Is that now public? Will people be able to see the details somewhere? Because it's a massive change and it really is a huge piece of work you're doing. Um, well, we are starting to roll out informing uh, um, fellow government departments. Uh, the Secretaries General are coming in to to see the structures um, next week, I understand. Uh, and I believe the Department of Health actually was breached, briefed last week. Um, and uh, those ERG reports are all available online, yeah. and there yeah. is information about the transformation process on our website. But yeah. I should say that the penny is probably really only dropping now with our key stakeholders, including our ministers, yeah. about just how radical a change is right. going to be coming okay. through. Thank you very much for that, Una. Um, now, dear Joy, I hadn't forgotten about you, um, and you invited us all here, so thank you very much for that. And uh, we're going to ask you now, if you wouldn't mind, just at the end of this particular <coughs> five-minute slot, if you would give us your overview, please. Um, it's a dif it is difficult and different coming in from the wheel at this end of it, so good luck to you. Anyway, <laughs> I'll still keep you to five minutes, if I can. Excellent, and I love your style. In conclusion, this is something I will borrow from you. So good morning, everybody, and welcome. This is my first time at the microphone, so I'm going to say that. Um, and I'd really like to thank the panellists. I think we've set up a really great discussion, and we've got a good bit of time left for it. And I guess I have the advantage of coming as the last speaker to do my five minutes, because I think the... The points really that I would like to make connects some of what we've heard and maybe set up some of the questions for the discussion. Because I guess w w one of the things that I was struck by was uh, Kevin's statement, and I hope I'm not misquoting you, uh, about the fact that this is, I guess, one of Ireland's success stories. And uh, I was really struck by that. And you, speak, you spoke, you went on to, to speak, I'm actually just going to write it down, one of the great success stories of Irish enterprise, and you went on to say social enterprise and social activism. Um, so I, I think that that's, that was a really important thing to hear, and I, I think that's really good. Um, I'm, I'm going to, I guess, link that with what Jane said about one of the findings that you found almost immediately to be true was the state of total interdependence of the, the two sectors, the public sphere, I guess, the public service delivery through the statutory 
side and then the public service delivery through the voluntary side of things. And uh, you didn't, I don't know that you said it in, in, in your uh, statement here today, but in the report, not only do you use the word interdependence really strongly, but you also use the word independence in the report uh, very strongly. And I think that that's a really important thing that sets us up maybe for an interesting discussion because how much is there an appetite for independence? Interdependence, I guess, would be my question. Um, I was struck by when the, uh, Jane Ann was speaking about Sláinte Care and because you spoke very uh, passionately about the, the, the need to deliver the health services and the public services through a variety of different partners and actors. And, and I'm struck by, in our world, we talk about the, the public services delivered from the public sector, the public services delivered by the private sector, and the public services delivered by the voluntary sector. And I've sat in rooms with senior HSE people saying absolutely clearly, we have a panoply uh, in front of us and we have to deploy these to their best, unique contributions. But I've sat in rooms recently and I've been told that actually the public services are delivered through the public sector and the private sector. It's like we don't exist our sector. So that's a very worrying um, thing. And I think just as an elephant in the room, I think it is important to actually surface. Um, our, is our sector uh, uh, an important and respected success story with which the state has to find a positive contribution for our independent nature, but also our uh, absolute symbiotic relationship with the state in relation to the provision of public services. Not necessarily in relation to everything that the sector does, for sure. So I guess that's just one of the questions that I would tee up. It's like, what, what really uh, is the, the underlying philosophical belief? Because the words are there about respect and interdependence uh, and a great success story, but when it comes to practice, I think it, that's, that's where the, 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 issue, the question is. And then the second main question is that, gosh, when I went through all those reports, I was sure there were some people in the room here today going, holy, you know, I'm confused, three slides in. Um, and then we throw in rural and we throw in all the other background strategies. A person could get completely lost in all these strategies. And I guess the question is, well, what next? Like, so what? Mm. You know, are these just another set of strategies that similar enough to the white, the white paper of mm. almost 20 years ago, um, which, which did achieve certain things in laying down important principles of respect for the sector, but in fairness, um, f fell short of actually delivering real change. Mm -hmm. And that change then has built up ever so much, like a dam bursting now, all of these mm. policies, this huge expectation in the sector. So, and I guess my question then is, um, the interdepartmental work, the intra-departmental work, and then the inter-sectoral work, like, if these strategies are going to mean anything in terms of real change, we have to grasp how on earth we can do intra-department, inter-department, and inter-sector. Um, and I'm looking at <laughs> Una and Kevin down there, and, and I'm, I'm looking at a Sláinte Care office being set up just to do that across a range of stakeholders, and I know it's really difficult. And, and I guess that would be a real question, because if we don't figure out how to do that as an important how, these documents you know, won't produce the change that we, the sector, require them to do. Yeah. I won't go through the details of what we require them to do because Ivan has gone through that, but we need to see them being taken seriously. We need to figure that out, and we need to figure out where, the, I guess, that relationship and that relationship of respect and of mm -hmm. distinctive and equal but independent and interdependent sectors mm. and where we play that out together. And that's why I think this conversation will be really informative and helpful. And um, I think Una's tip about us really trying to understand the gaps between what we think is right and wrong with the world mm. and what the actual policy priorities are, I think was a, a really yeah. helpful hint. Yeah, okay, thanks very much, Deirdre, for that. Thank you, she gets a clap as well, come on. <laughs> we'll give them all a clap. Um, and and uh, while I said Deirdre's road kind of there at the end was a little bit difficult, I also want to recognise that all of the other people here are statutory um, uh, actors who don't need to come along to the Wheel Summit and kind of, you know, be exposed to questions that 
you, you know, that we're, we're, we're now asking and that you're having to think about. So really grateful to you all mm. on that basis. And, um, and this, is, this is actually where I have the best bit because I get to ask questions that have been kind of upsetting me, but dear to put it better, and I'd love to be able to remember the way she put it. One of the things I really wonder is, if the world was an ideal world, I suppose I'm looking at Una, Kevin, and Jane Ann, maybe, in some ways, and then maybe get an input of what Jane would have found, and also Helen. In an, if the world was ideal, and you could do things exactly the way you wanted to, would the state deliver everything, including finding those people that Una, you mentioned, were hard to find? And would the state kind of say, yes, volunteers are great, but actually, in terms of service delivery, let the state do it all. What do you think? jane Ann? it's also in the implementation that, that the voluntary community and voluntary sector is one of the partners. If the world was ideal, would you have them at all? Well, I think there's different views yeah. um, when it comes to that. I mean, certainly the Oireachtas report on the future of healthcare, the first launch care report, um, they seem to sort of take the view, and Jane might be able to correct me here, that perhaps the state should be doing these things. But I certainly know that when the independent review group was set up, I, I believe it was a different recommendation that the community and voluntary sector have a very yeah. unique part to play um, yeah. and that they should remain integral for, for many years. Yeah. But I understand, I mean, getting that balance right is, yeah. is very difficult. Yeah. Una? I don't want to live in a country where the state does everything. Yeah. Uh, I think there is a role for the state, I think there is a role for the commercial sector, the profit-making sector, and there is a role for non-profits and charitable sector. There has to be if the state is to work in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a smooth way. Yeah. Um, and the fact is that, I mean, the, the alternative to not-for-profits and grant aiding is that we would purchase services yes. from commercial providers but I don't believe that that would get to the people that we need to. There's been a lot of experimentation in that space, for example, in the United Kingdom and the justice sector, and they're, they're winding it back. Mm -hmm. And um, so I think that there is clearly a role for all three types of actor. The question, I suppose, is are we getting it right? And I, I mentioned direct provision earlier. Direct provision is a very high on our list of agenda items of needing to look at how we manage that and perhaps managing that in a way that mixes more, that moves away from the commercial model to a more funded model, a more state provided model, a different model. Mm -hmm. So that, that's something that's very high on our agenda just at the moment. Yeah. Um, Kevin, do you? Yeah, just I suppose to add, I mean, um Deirdre quoted something that I said in my opening remarks and quoted accurately, I should say, um, around oh, good. <laughs> the, the use of the word entrepreneurship in this context. And I know that that's a word and using, talking about enterprise and entrepreneurship is probably something that grates with people. But I do believe we have a unique Irish model here mm. that the innovation, the capacity to respond to need, the agility that, that we have in delivering services to people on the ground mm. that wouldn't otherwise be delivered to people, that meet yeah. the needs of the most marginalised in society. It relies on the capacity of people to think for themselves, to act, mm. and to be supported in doing that. Mm. And I think for me, that's where the, rela the state's relationship yeah. with the community and voluntary sector comes right. in. The state is the enabler, the supporter. The state obviously has a role in directly providing yeah. key services, and it has, a, it has a responsibility for delivering key services. It also has a responsibility for creating the conditions to allow communities to identify for themselves how they can meet their own needs. Yeah. And um, if, I can, if I can be so crude as to ask, uh, does the fact that very often they're cheaper than commercial services come into it at all from your point of view? Well, I think there's, there, like, there is a value proposition. Uh, mm. You know, if you were to rely on either public service organizations or for-profit providers. Yeah. Certainly, there's, there, there's a value proposition, but I mean, I mean value not simply in economic or effectiveness terms, but the fact that people are prepared to, to do what needs to be done on a not-for-profit basis. Um, for me, the value in that is that society's, society is, is getting the best of itself. Yeah. And, and, and ultimately, that's in everybody's interest. And, and you're clearly seeing that because you're the lead in relation to voluntary organisations and the rest of it. At your end, Una, although your funding is going out less, 
Mm. Is there something about it, the fact that actually the voluntary sector will undercut the commercial sector very often? Um, look, I mean, I, I won't, you know, I won't lie yeah. that you know there's a there is a limited budget for to try and deliver what we can do, and the, the you know one of our obligations as public servants is to try and ensure that um, we make the funding that we have go as far as possible. So uh, that's part of, as as Kevin politely put it, the value proposition yeah. that we get from NGOs. But I just want to go back to that thing I started off by with saying that NGOs can actually find people yeah. that we can't find. So look, large scale activity like paying social welfare, that has to be delivered by the state. Yeah. I mean, major health has to be delivered by the state. But targeted interventions for people with really specific needs, you can be, you, we are better off many times using people who can see that, who are right up front to that, and who, who a are acting within the community where they're side by side with the people who are getting that help. Mm. So that's, so I would agree with Kevin, the value goes beyond just yeah. cost, it's, it's getting the right targeted interventions at the yeah. right place. Um, and so that means that the community and voluntary sector can bring you insights into how, into what's needed in terms of service delivery in some way. Mm. D did you find that, Jane, when you, were, when you were working on your report, did you find that that was recognised or that, or, or, wh what, what did you find about that? Are the insights from the community and voluntary sector, is the voice of that sector heard in, in the statutories? Well, I, I think, um, so for two, there are two points I'd make. The, the, the first is that, um, we certainly got a sense that there were, were some people who thought it'd be much simpler if we just got rid of the volunteers. Yes. Uh, they're, they're just awkward, um, independent boards, independent thinking and that kind of thing. Uh, but it was so obvious to us um, not only the critical role that the voluntary sector pays, plays, uh, but also the added value that they, that they bring. And the fact that it can work in other countries is, is not impossible. However, if you're going to make it work, then they have to be recognised as an integral part of the health and social care delivery yeah. system. Yeah. And that was why one of our recommendations is around the forum of getting everybody around the table and develop a model that is truly citizen or person-centred, because the voluntaries tend to have a much more uh, person-centred view. And I, you know, this is an important part of uh, Slaunch Care, is, is to have a much more person-centred uh, delivery system and uh, because they're much more uh, linked into local needs and, and if we had better data on the, on, on the population needs uh, at a local level, it'd be very important. The other thing I would say is that um, be careful what you wish for. One of, we, w one of our roles was to look at the, um, uh, the role of faith-based organizations. And uh, so one of the issues that came up was, well, can, um, uh, can an organization refuse to deliver a particular legally, legally permitted service uh, because of its ethos, uh, because it goes against its ethos? Uh, so can it say, no, we're not going to do this? Uh, and I'm assuming that it would have the skills and expertise to be able to deliver the service under normal circumstances. So, okay, well, you can say, um, uh, no, they can't do that. They're in receipt of state funding, so therefore they have to deliver all the legally provided services within their, 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 their sphere. So what are you going to do? Are you going to then say, right, well, we're not going to fund them for anything? Now, we've got a third of our, our, our hospital uh, beds are in the voluntary sector, so what are, we, what are we going to do? What is the consequence of that? And it was very obvious to us that even looking at that area, the massive disruption that would be caused to the service would just be, would be colossal and would be very detrimental over a considerable period of time. So it, 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 it's, it, it's just, you just can't conceive of doing that. So what we need to do is to integrate the voluntary sector much more into the, the policy making, the, 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 the service delivery, while at the same time recognizing that they are independent organizations and that they have their own boards and they do have uh, autonomy, mm -hmm. which is actually of benefit because it can be closer to the, to the service users. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. That, that's really useful. And Jen Ann, would you sort of see that also as, the, as, as a sort of a challenge to get that, that mix right, to get that, that coherence? It certainly is a challenge, and I, I would really echo 
everything that's yeah. just been said in the comments. Just to respond to what Deirdre had asked in regards to the language of the yeah. private sector, uh, certainly when I became a civil servant, I myself found that confusing and I associated it with um, profit making. Yeah. Um, but certainly since I've gone in, whenever we do talk about the private sector, it just means non-statutory. So it does include the voluntary and very often it's the voluntary sector that is um, uh, doing an awful lot more of the work than in the others. And we launched an integration fund a few weeks ago, um, calls for proposals of really how to move more care into the community. But one of the stipulations of that was that it did need to be a not-for-profit entity, mm. whether mm. that was going to be statutory. Mm. Or I voluntary. think the trouble with calling everything that's not statutory private mm. is that people think of private as commercial, isn't that it? I do hear what you're saying, so yeah, it's funny how you get so used to the language maybe a, quite quickly. a tiny yes. recommendation going around is that uh, there could be a bit of to an adjustment it. there as well. Um, and then just, uh, and I do want to go out, to maybe we haven't much time, but I might want to go out to a couple of people in the audience. So if you have a burning point, uh, be thinking about how you put it very succinctly, because I'll cut you off as well, um, <laughs> and to allow more people in. But, but just, Helen, can I just come to you in that, uh, that whole area? That Ivan mentioned that Indocan study that's going on at the moment, just around the whole area of coherence, around the whole area of trying to manage multiple reporting, managing um, how, how, charities, how, uh, how charities operate. Because it, you're not even dealing with the whole voluntary sector, you're just dealing with a subset of it, aren't you? But that's true, that's, yeah. that's exactly true. Yeah. And I mean, we, we are aware, obviously we get feedback from charities um, who would say that, and I, in fact, I think I remember someone coming into a meeting with a massive binder yeah. saying to us, look, they, this, these are all um, the information requests that I have to respond to. Yeah. And some of them might be layers upon layers upon layers from the same organisation. Yeah. And I think that was it was picked up, and I was glad to see it picked up um, clearly um, in, Jane's, in Jane's report, mm. yeah. um, that that came out, because that was certainly something that we're very conscious of. And one of the reasons why we had wanted to do the feasibility study with regard to um, what's referred to as a, a charity passport is um, to look at the feasibility of that but also to look at the reality and to get some facts out there as to what in fact charities are facing in terms of the information requirements that are on them mm -hmm. and whether um, there, is, there is massive duplication there um, put the facts out there for the benefit of the charity sector so that there can be a dialogue around mm. that. Um, we talk about the, the charity passport and one of the things I did say when I was speaking um, at an event last year um, to youth organisations is that I think there's this idea out there that this charity passport will solve, solve everything. But the very idea of a passport is that it is, it's accepted by other entities, okay? So the idea that you have an information source that other people want to use mm. and are willing to use um, is a key requirement. And with regard to charities, in our case, we are awaiting certain legislative amendments so that we can have um, uh, regulations in place, that we can have uh, publishing of financial uh, accounts uh, of charities and we can get greater transparency in there. But as you pointed out, Nolan, that will only relate to charities. Mm. You know, that level of transparency will only, will only relate to charities. But I'm looking forward to the, I, I've yeah. you know, spoken with Indicon about the work that they're doing for us. Yeah. And I think it's going to be very interesting mm. yeah. for people. And it really is um, what the charities regulator can do yeah. to facilitate that dialogue on behalf yeah. of the charity sector. So to get people talking about it and to see if we can get some facts out there yeah. that the people can work with all the different stakeholders, the charities, the yeah. funders, yeah. Um, and everybody can come together and yeah. see, see what can be done in that area. Yeah, that's great. Um, is Colin Crawford here? There you are. Yeah. Uh, good. I'm going to come to you third, Colin, the voice from the floor, but have I two other people who, who have a question? I have one back here and I recognise the questioner. <laughs> I'm going to keep you very tight, Eddie Malloy. We were on the Commission on the Future of Policing together. Uh, he can talk. And we have one other back there as well, over in the corner. Okay. So can you say who you are, although I've outed Eddie already, but uh, can you say who you are and what your question is? Go ahead. Yeah, it's more, more a comment um, yeah. on Deirdre's uh, concern about the, if you like, the, the state's lack of respect for the sector. Uh, it's not that long ago I can remember Charlie McCreevy referring contemptuously to the sector as the poverty lobby. 
Uh, and I think there are other uh, uh, manifestations of the state's attitude, for example, barring NGOs from uh, getting involved in advocacy if yeah. they're in receipt of public money. I think that needs to change. I think, Una, in relation to the Department of Justice relationship with the sector, I think a game changer will be one of the uh, central conclusions of the Commission on the Future of Policing. And the simplest way to express it is that the more than 50%, probably up to 60, even up to 70% of police work is actually not crime busting. It has to do with family disputes, mental health issues, homelessness, people who are fearful living in their own homes, etc. And also the police are the only actors really there 24 seven. And what we came to, one of the things, the insights I got from the work in the Commission of the Policing is that the, 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 the commission's name was not a commission on police, but on policing. And policing, to be successful, will now require very close work between the guards and the people in this room yep. and the, the other services. That's okay. what, it's a new concept of policing. And it's that focus in on the community. Uh, on, yeah. All right, thanks, Eddie. Who, who's, somebody else has Sean a mic Healy. there at the back. Sean oh, Shea, is it? All right, it's okay. Sean Healy. Sean Healy. Mm -hmm. that, uh, or, uh, yeah, there's, is there a mic down there? Yeah. And then, Callum, I'm going to come to you then. Th thanks, Chair. This is Sean Healy, Social Justice Ireland. Mine is in the nature of a comment, but it follows on from Eddie Malloy's comment, having been the target myself of that comment by Charlie McCreevy of the, he called it the poverty industry, actually, yeah. uh, and basically was abusive of it. I, I would want to say that in my experience over more than three decades, that we now are in a very poor situation in terms of dialogue between this sector and government. Uh, from a situation where Ireland had one of the best social dialogue structures in Europe and was the envy of many, we now have probably the worst, or one of the worst, uh, social dialogue um, structures uh, in, the, in the European Union. And the reason I make that point is that dialogue is an essential component of social dialogue. Mm -hmm. Asking for submissions, which happens at a great rate uh, from government, and as an organization that makes submissions a great many times ourselves, I know that we put a lot of work into that, but the idea that in some way or other government says, let us know what you think and we'll decide whether or not we listen to or pick up anything that you do, that is not dialogue. Yeah. But dialogue is essential for the future of this society, not yeah. just in terms of delivery of services and so on, but also, in, I would argue, in terms of the very existence of our democratic structures, which we maybe should bear in mind given tomorrow's ballot, for example, yeah. because we are in fact in a situation where dialogue is in decline okay. when it should be going the other way. Thank you very much, Sean, for that. Um, and and, and those, those are points around, uh, around dialogue, around the, um, the, the failure to recognize advocacy, um, as, as an important insight into the statutory sector. But, but I actually want to go to Callum at this stage, uh, please. And then I'll see if I can do another round of questions straight after that, yeah. Thank you, I had a mic. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Nonian. Um, Colin Crawford is my name. I've been the executive director with the Association of Irish Festival Events for over 12 years. I'm 25 years in the not-for-profit community cultural celebrations and festival sector. And I want to touch upon a couple of points very briefly and then uh, offer a question. Um, the community sector that I work in is exhausted. Uh, the burdens of bureaucracy, the costs of regulation, the damage that has been done to the ecology with full employment, which is damage in a sense, scheme churn, and critically, then loss of 95 town councils, Phil Hogan's lasting gift to public administration in the island. The community worker is an exhausted and a dying species. The demographic gap and emerging that we saw from the slide earlier on means that to some communities, our volunteers are aging. They're not all WhatsAppers. Um, there is a lack of lifers in our communities who for 30, for 25 years, have been associated with a piping school, with an art center, with a health needs center, with, this, with a uh, um, home meals run. Uh, people do a couple of seasons and then move on out of exhaustion. Um, we are coming down 
in, in non-metropolitan Ireland with buildings and the burden of managing all these facilities with no full-time or part-time staff or resources to keep the lights on. In my own town, we have eight public funded sports facilities with nine sets of outdoor lights. If all the lights in Banlaslow were turned on, the planes would divert from Shannon or knock at night. We can't feel the senior team in any code. We have no full-time staff to manage the facilities, and once again, when the sports capital rounds will, will, will be announced, we'll have a raft of applications in for them. So there's a disconnect going on here. Every scheme that's been announced by government in the last five years is shovel ready, but the people to hold the shovels are exhausted. We are concrete focused, but not the soft social capital that can do stuff with the concrete. What will be the social capital that we can hinge or hook with, with, with all this going into the future? We're an exhausted and frustrated sector. I'm listening to Sean Og, Sean Healy rather. I can recall at a conference years ago where a certain Prime Minister extolled the virtue of having bowling alone as his reading material on his bedside shelf. <laughs> Such was the dialogue at the time. Um, we have schemes where if the state invests, Callum, sorry, really there's sorry a percentage for art. Yeah. Okay. I think we now need to look at a percentage for the volunteers. We're exhausted. Thank yeah. you very much. Yeah, I think that's really important. Um, and, and you were teed up to say it because it's really important that we recognise that, that people are giving way beyond uh, a tank of fuel. They're giving they're, and, and running on empty, a lot of people running on empty have taken an awful lot of hits and it hasn't come back up. Um, I think I'm on my last couple of minutes, aren't I? Um, uh, I? I know because Elizabeth has a flag there that she's doing. I'll, I might just take one or two more comments and then literally I will just get maybe one sentence back or so from each of the people. Elizabeth, is that allowed? Okay, great, lovely. So, yeah, I, I do need to bring a couple of women in, so yeah. Yes, you do. <laughs> Sorry, and, and I'd have you on your own strength anyway, but... <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Um, I'm Siobhan. CEO of Actionate Ireland. Um, compliments to the wheel, um, uh, Paul and Deirdre and the well, team, yeah. for putting together a really, really powerful panel, insi huge insights and huge challenges that we'll take forward in the debate. But I wanted to take the opportunity to hone in on one specific thing, because I think we're also a community of doers that I heard Una Buckley saying about re uh, reforming or at least paying attention to direct provision being high on her agenda. And I really wanted, and I think we have support in the room for that, I really wanted to encourage her to do that and to support them along the way to do that. It must be done. It's an abomination, the current system. And I think lots of us in the room are, feel really strongly about that. So I know it's honing in on a detail, but I just wanted to take my yeah. opportunity. Yeah, no, thanks very thank much. Thank you to Una. Very, very, well said. And, and the last question from the floor. Uh, Zoriana Pshek, Community Education, Kildare Viklo Educational Training Board. Would you stand up, please? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, an ex-asylum seeker. I just wanted to ask Una as well and connect it with your question. Uh, would you envision the, the uh, restructuring of the Department of Justice uh, would impact the waiting times for people who are in direct provision? And what would you envision to be done um, to, uh, to narrow the waiting times for those people who are in direct provision for more than three years? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Una, you'll get two sentences, <laughs> if you can answer that one. So a, a couple of things about direct provision. Um, we are going to have a look at the way in which we provide it, but I don't want people to, to misunderstand me. Uh, people present themselves as Berg Key. They ask for asylum. They, many of them have come from very difficult scenarios. They have needs. Some of them don't even know what country they're in. Uh, the state is obliged under EU law to, to offer them services, including accommodation, and we will continue to have to do that. The question is how we go about that. So I don't think it is appropriate that we would go back to the, the model of 20 years ago, when in effect the very small number of asylum seekers would present themselves, and we would say, we would take their fingerprints, take their names and details, give them a, a, a chunk of social welfare money and say, good luck now. We're not, we can't do that. So some model of accommodation is necessary, and it's actually easier for us to provide public services, the kind of key services around health, uh, for traumatized people and so forth, into a congregated setting of some description. Now the second question I was asked was, why is the system Waiting so time. slow? 
Um, separate to the major reform that's going on in the department, we have a program of very serious reforms happening within our uh, immigration service delivery area, as it's going to be called, or Inish, as it is now. Uh, and those times are coming back painfully slowly as we implement the 2015 legislation. Um, it, uh, both my Secretary General, Aidan O'Driscoll, and I are very keen on bringing them back as quickly as we can. I, I've just come from being the head of an organisation where we were processing employment claims on an average of six months. I don't see why we shouldn't be able to do that on a first decision yeah. on an asylum claim. Be, might be careful what you wish for, of course. That initial decision might be a quicker no. Mm. You know, so, um, so I just want to say that the department, we acknowledge that the system as it stands is too slow and we are working very hard to try and improve it. Um, I would also say though that there is, everybody now is getting a first decision in much quicker than three years. Um, there are very small numbers over, and I acknowledge this is too long, but over two years in the direct provision centres. So where those people are in a direct provision centre for a long time, it tends to be because uh, they are appealing or have been involved in a legal challenge. And in some cases, actually, people are living in our direct provision centres. We have 700 people with the right to remain in Ireland, and they have not left our centres yeah. because they can't find somewhere yeah. to, else to live. And, and that is okay. a real problem. I, I always uh, it's kind of a Pavlovian reaction whenever you guys in justice say legal challenges are delaying the process I'm going the legal challenges mightn't happen if the previous decisions were but anyway th that's a different day's work <laughs> or thank you very much Una <laughs> because uh, uh, yeah thank you very much I'll, I'll now that you've started Kevin I might ask you do you um, I think you've you, you, you you've heard some things about just um, about this sector just yeah, yeah and uh, look I mean, I, I, I hear the points that are being made around dialogue and so on. I don't fully recognise the characterisation around a lack of respect, but I can see where it's coming from. Yeah. And I think the, the job that we have as a department on behalf of government is to try to understand and address those concerns. I think, I mean, what Jane was talking about and describing in respect of the forum for the health sector, for example, is, is, is a very interesting proposition. And there are similar ideas emerging in the, in the implementation plan the action plan um, for local and community development. What we're doing at a local level in respect of the LCDC structure and the public participation network structure are really important parts of an architecture to try and get coherence to conversations. Because, I mean, one of the things that's very striking when you hear Jane Ann and Jane on the one hand talk about the health sector and the scale of some of the voluntary organizations there versus some of what I've been talking about around really small one and two people organizations at a community level who, as we have heard, are exhausted, um, who are operating under a regu regulatory compliance burden, who are trying to respond to opportunity on a goodwill basis, who need training, capacity, support, all of those things. So there's, there's, there's a lot of audiences to this conversation. There's, there's, there's a lot of complexity to what we're doing at the centre across the range of government programmes. I failed badly to get across in five minutes what we're doing. Um, you know, we, 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 we would take all day to try and map out what's happening right across government. Yeah. So the drive for simplicity around creating a coherence on that is natural, but it's difficult. And I suppose dialogue is core to that for us to understand the needs, to hear the concerns, to work out with you how we can create better conditions for that dialogue. Yeah. And I suppose it does, it does link back to Deirdre's point initially around strategies being all very well and good, yeah. but it's all about the implementation. Yeah. So getting the structures for delivery right around that is, is, is okay. key. But also strategies are important because there's a lot of tension in that relationship mm. between state and voluntary providers naturally. But by agreeing principles, agreeing a roadmap, yeah. you can at least help to surface and resolve some of those yeah. in terms of an agreed way forward. Because yeah. if you don't have the strategy, any old thing Absolutely. Would do, yeah, any old road would do. Great. Thank you very much for that. Jane, do you have any concluding comments? I, well, I, 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 su I suppose I'd, I'd come back, I'm, I suppose I'm reiterating what I said before. I think um, I think some of the recommendations that we have in our report um, are probably quite challenging to implement. Um, you know, the list of essential services would be quite difficult, I think, to, to, to first of all define what the essential services are and then to come up with a, a full cost uh, for each of them. Uh, but I think the forum is potentially, if it can be made to work probably with an independent chair, 
uh, I think it could really begin to, to change the, the relationship and change the dialogue. And I come back again to this point. I'm, um, as some of you may know, my area of research when I was an academic was all around e-health and IT. And I was kind of obsessed with the idea that the whole thing had to be patient-centered. It's not about providing IT support to, to hospitals and GPs. It has to be about you know, dealing with the, the information about the individual patient. So I'd say the same thing, that the forum needs to, to focus on meeting the, uh, the needs of the population at, you know, at an individual, local, and community level. And that should be the, st the starting point of all this dialogue. It's difficult, it's difficult, but you, you people have a much better connection to that than the sort of b big national uh, level. So I think there's a, there's a lot of potential if that forum can be got up, running, up and running to allow a number of our other rec recommendations to be yeah, moved forward. It's great to see that proceeded. happen. Yeah, thank you very much. Jane Ann. Uh, yeah, yes, I suppose I'll build on what Jane said uh, with the forum. My understanding is that that recommendation is going to be brought forward and that there will be that dialogue for um, the statutory and the CNV sector working on the health area. Um, I suppose I've also been somewhat surprised by some of the comments that I've heard. I, I'm quite a new civil servant, but I worked in drugs policy, where we certainly, the steering committee, all the groups that um, developed that strategy, reducing harm, support and recovery, um, there was an awful lot of representation from the community and voluntary sector, and they agreed, and certainly in Europe it was highlighted that Ireland was at the forefront of that dialogue when it came to drug policy anyway. Um, but I've no doubt that there might be other areas that aren't as advanced on that stage. And yes, we look forward to dialogue over the future yeah. years. Over the and I think years. what Sean's point, uh, although I, I'm loath to <laughs> try to paraphrase Sean Healy, but I think his point was that just bringing people into a room is not the same thing as having a di dialogue either, you know? So it's just to, to get that, that going better. Sure. Thank you very much. Helen, do you have any closing comments you'd like to make? On um, I think going back to what, what uh, Ivan was saying originally, you know, about this being a time of transition and there always been opportunities with that. Uh, I would see that very much in, in the charity sector. You know, we're regulating a sector, but we can't achieve everything that the sector needs in terms of ultimately increasing trust and confidence in the sector as a regulator without the cooperation of the regulated and also without the uh, cooperation of funders and also the public and, and people who are donating to charities. And one of the things that we would have always talked about, my background was originally, um, in, when I was in the private sector, was in telecoms, is this idea, you would often hear it at regulatory events where they would be saying that, you know, um, transparency was the best uh, sanitizer. So if you could bring things out into the light, um, you know, people know what you're doing, they have confidence in what you're doing. Um, and I think it, it, we look at things like bridged accounts. There's been an increase, Benefax have reported, an increase in bridged accounts by charities. Um, um, because they can. There's an exemption there under the, Char under the Companies Act and charities can have abridged accounts. In my view, it's not the right thing to do because at a time when you're trying to build trust and confidence, it doesn't make sense not to be absolutely clear about your finances and your activities and what you're doing. So if I could say to people here today, you've got, in my view, great tools available to you. We're always looking and taking into account the feedback that we get from charities and the public as to other, other guidance that we can provide and other things that we can work in. But if you take what's there, and if you're confident that you're applying those, those codes that are in the, the governance code, there should be no issues around, around transparency. And I would say to people, publish your own accounts. We're not in a position to publish everybody's accounts at the moment. We don't publish those uh, that are related to unincorporated charities, so your, your associations yeah. and things. We hope to do that, but there's no reason why you can't do okay. that yourselves and provide that assurance so that we can increase trust right. and confidence. Okay. That's, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Deirdre, Thank you. have you um, I do. a last word? I do indeed. I'm and sorry, I'm Deirdre, just I going didn't answer to any of your questions or any of Ivan's questions either. Let hey, oh, if they were I easy, they might have yeah, been answered. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listen, it was just pointed out that what our sector can do really well is be person-centred, right? The person has a rounded life, right? So if our organizations in our sector are, are actually, and we are, person-centered, which means we cross over a wide range of government departments, and I think that's really clear. Mm. So I guess the one crucial overarching thing that I would suggest is that a whole of government approach is needed. It is uh, the sector touches people across yeah. a significant number of government departments, if not all, then a significant majority. So a whole of government approach is needed to meaningful implementation 
of the strategies and policies that we have currently in play or in the cooking pot. That's the, that's the Catherine Day report that Jane is co-author of, the Independent Review Group report, including the forum and the other recommendations that it says. It includes the, uh, the three reports and the other background ones in the rural action and many others coming from departments. When I say meaningful implementation, I'm going to actually define what that means in terms of well, two pieces. Well, you are if you're budget, be very quick about it. Budget yeah. and structured dialogue. Yeah. yeah. Structured dialogue, not by grace and favour, because it's a structured engagement and co-implementation. It's not grace and favour, and it's structured. You have a right to be there. We're recognised. It's the relationship. Yeah. Because if those things are put in there, money and the processes, because we are people-centred, the relationship will become righted in a more balanced way across where it needs to be. Yeah. And some places better, some places very, very bad. Yeah. So that would be my that's, I mean, that's, whole that's of government really sound. implementation approach. Uh, that's really sound. Uh, thank you very much for, for summing that up at the end to try and just kind of say it's doable, hard but doable, the whole, the whole thing. Uh, can, we, we can actually accomplish that people-centred um, delivery of crucial rights-based services yeah. to the community right across a whole a range of actors. Um, may I ask you to put your hands together to give a great round of applause to a marvellous panel. Uh, I, do, I do think it's not easy for the statutories. They're coming, they're coming into a place where they're likely to be criticised or at, at the very least told they're not recognising the community and voluntary sector enough. So like, thanks very much for that. And, uh, and, uh, and thank you very much indeed as well for all of the various insights, which I think did lead to a really valuable uh, contribution. Let's